Good afternoon and welcome to our Bantry Bay raft up to the uh, Wooden Boat Association of New South Wales. Bantry Bay was a, an old explosive depot for the Navy during World War II. These old munitions stores are no longer in use and there's no admittance allowed to the uh, foreshore. But the other side of the foreshore, where we've just had our barbecue picnic, is very accessible from Seaford Oval. And Bantry Bay is a fabulous spot up in Middle Harbour. Uh, we came under the pit bridge yesterday afternoon and uh, had a great night last night. The forecast has been terrific. So uh, that's, that's our setting. Uh, I'm Peter Witters, President of the Wooden Boat Association, and this is my wife, Grace. And we're on board our 34 foot sloop, 10 metre sloop, King Billy. Um, which we built over a six and a half year period. I say we built because Grace is a great help looking after our two sons <laughs> who were born uh, during the, uh, the build process and uh, were an important part of the build. Uh, this is a coal moulded strip paint cutter designed by Chuck Payne, uh, the American designer based in Camden and Maine. We were fortunate to be able to go and call in and see Chuck and spend two and a half hours in his office on the harbour in Camden, Maine. And uh, it was a place where all the schooners went in and out in the summer trade. And um, his uh, plans were fabulous. There have been 17 of these types of boats built in the UK in glass. We believe this is the first wooden boat uh, of the Victoria 34 design. It's called a Payne Withers 34 because it has a modified keel and rudder. It has an improved old wing keel and a classic above the waterline profile. Construction is um, three skins, the first skin of 50, uh, 20 mil Oregon and uh, followed by two skins of diagonal Kimberley pine, uh, three mil veneer and it's sheathed with six ounce glass cloth, uh, all West System um, glue and um, resin. Uh, it has a nanny 21 horse diesel and um, sails really well. The balance is exceptional. And uh, the accommodation is a classic layout, as you'll see in a little while. When we first launched it in February 1997, we used to go up to the Hawkesbury for the next 10 years, uh, two or three times a year. And uh, the kids had a ball. We'd have the hot time of the day uh, down below doing craft stuff. And um, morning and afternoon, we'd go and either that snorkel or if the sandbanks were up, we'd go and play cricket on the beach uh, <laughs> in Yeomans Bay or Smith's Creek or uh, any one of the different bays, Warwickar Bay, or sometimes Grace and the kids go to walk up to uh, from uh, Warwickar Bay or Jerusalem Bay, get a hamburger and a Coke and come back down. And it takes us about an hour and a half to get up there and 20 minutes to come down again. <laughs> <laughs> so down below is a classic layout um, of uh, the boat. See when you come down below to the uh, galley in the port and a chart table to starboard side, and there's a quarter berth uh, down in the uh, starboard quarter area of the boat. The main cabin itself is a, chink, uh, a table made out of King Billy pine because it was a shame to have the boat called King Billy. Uh, but no King Billy Pine visible. And uh, I think we've, most we've had seated around this table is 10 people at the various festivals or other places. So uh, the uh, galley has a two burner stove with a grill and an oven, a broad water stove, and that's been a great asset when we've got rainy weather, come back onto a mooring and go down below for a batch of hot muffins and coffee. Uh, when you need to get out of the rain. The, um, on the starboard side of the chart table and the quarter berth, which used to be our quarter berth when the kids were on board, and uh, it's just a very comfortable interior, very snug down below, a really good sea boat, and as I said, the balance is exceptional uh, in sailing trim. Further forward, we have a uh, couple of hanging lockers 
and uh, there is also a head to port and a very comfortable uh, double V berth in the bow. And you can see some of uh, Grace's quilting handiwork. Uh, Grace said when I was building it, she wanted a, uh, a teak deck. And I said, okay, I want Marin as a so <laughs> that's still uh, part of the boat. That's not the particular one we're using at the moment. So she's just a really comfortable boat. The only modification we made to the plans was to put an extra inch and a quarter in the topside height because uh, I'm six foot three tall and our sons, two sons are both taller than me, so we needed to get a bit of uh, headroom. Although we used to be able to tell where they were from one of them, particularly hitting his head on every obstruction down below that he could find. So talk to us a little bit about uh, how she sails. The sailing uh, is great. We have a, um, uh, a big number one Genoa that we only used about a dozen times because it was only good in winds up to about 10 knots. So we've taken that home at the moment. And we have a full hoist Solent number three Genoa jib, which is really good. And that will go up to about 20 knots before we have to reef the main. And uh, she's a very uh, stable boat. Uh, heels a little bit initially, then it gets good stability. It's about four foot ten draft with the bulb wing keel. It's uh, it gets the weight concentrated, and then you can reduce the draft uh, on the boat. So uh, upwind and downwind and uh, motoring very easy to handle. So she goes well to windward. Yes, absolutely well. In, in some breezes, uh, from eight to about twenty knots, you can just about leave the helm unattended and she'll steer herself to windward and downwind again she's very easy to control and um, just really good sea boat rides the swirls really well and uh, she's an absolute delight. Mm -hmm. What kind of healing um, do you do you want to have uh, for a, a good groove? Oh, you get about 10 or 15 degrees and that uh, you can feel when it's in the groove because the balance is right as with most boats, there's a sweet spot in sailing. Them. And uh, we just adjust the sails a bit, travel her down, travel her up, and uh, she just goes like a train. Mm. Uh, the, the displacement length ratio is 250, which is not extreme lightweight nor extreme heavyweight. So uh, the lightweight boats now are 120, 150, or even lighter than that in the displacement length ratio, but 250 is a good solid boat and without being a heavyweight. Do you uh, steer uh, all the time or can you just lash the tiller? Or we can lash the tiller sometimes. The longest trip we've done was to Port uh, Lake Macquarie and that was a really good sail and you can lash the tiller. Uh, we don't have a self-steerer but you can lash the tiller and we pick our weather and go up with a uh, following wind or a quartering wind and uh, we don't need to bash ourselves or the boat and uh, it just makes good time. I think our fastest head-to-head -to, -head to the Hawkesbury was uh, from Sydney Heads to Barron Joey, where head, head was two and a quarter hours, which is, uh, was a pretty good breeze behind us, but it was, it was a good sail just for the two of us. What would you consider to be good speed? Um, we've had it up to eight and a half knots. Um, it's coming in the heads with a good swell behind us mm. and a good nor'easter. Um, but... Uh, She's not a planing boat, she's a displacement boat, but uh, we regularly get six and a half, seven knots in uh, uh, good breeze, and uh, that's great. Cool, very cool. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go back on deck and have a look around. This is our, uh, this is our new ladder. You may have seen featured in Scuttlebutt, our uh, Wooden Boat Association newsletter, folding ladder that I uh, designed and built from plans in Wooden Boat magazine and was fortunate to find a teak bookcase in uh, a lifeline store that I picked up for $125. Didn't look a very good price. Here's the ladder that we use to uh, hold the Now we put our anchor uh, tackle there because the bantry bay might want to let go of the anchor and 
Just a manual winch? Just a manual winch. Yeah, I agree with that. Very handy. The bowsprit is really good for getting the chain out onto the rollers. And you've got a 35 pound plow anchor. There is uh, seven metres of chain and a 14 mil rope with a mule uh, hand windlass to uh, go there. lower which goes to the upper spreader which is unusual but it's a, a, a rig that uh, Larry Marty used on Tallison and Seraphin. Uh, it just helps to stabilise the upper hounds for the uh, inner four stay. Nice. What's the width? Uh, 10 foot 8, 34 foot long and 10 foot 8 beam and uh, 4 foot 10 draft. Well, what's that in metres? 34 meters, 34 foot's 10 meters, and apart from that, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful boat. It's very seaworthy, I think. Certainly, you could take water on the deck without worrying oh, yeah. too much about it. It's great. It's uh, very stable, very comfortable. Nice wide side decks. Chuck Frame does yeah. a great the conventional above the water on uh, shear line and cabin. Uh, the cabin is great. The uh, cockpit dodger is very convenient when you're out at sea. Um, good shade. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, no, it's good shade. Uh, we just uh, love her. We've got a her uh, 24th birthday coming up in uh, a couple of weeks. Beautiful. 24 years, there you go. All right, shall we uh, move on to the next boat? Uh, I'll follow you. Thank you. All right. This is Solaris, a very different boat from an older era, reimagined in modern times by French naval architect Daniel Bombiger. She is at heart an early 20th century modern European fishing boat, and her design is in fact similar to the one Joshua Slocum found and sailed around the world, although she is quite a bit different and more modern in many respects as well. The, the main thing that you see on deck is around what we call in French a bathtub. And so the idea here is that you would get six people around this bathtub. Uh, they would bring the net in, dump uh, the net uh, in the middle, mend it, uh, and then open this hatch here that we have, which is now, of course, the engine hatch, but was uh, the, um, yep, uh, was the fish old. Uh, then mend the net and then chuck the ch chuck the net back out uh, into the water. And what that gives us in modern terms is, um, I suppose, what a, a cheesy real estate agent would call an entertainment deck, <laughs> uh, an entertainer's deck, perhaps. Um, so the, um, the the space that you have on deck is is very large. You can see uh, she is beamier, um, and uh, obviously. Uh, also being a workboat, not so much focused on, on performance and speed. There was some element of performance, I think, in, the, in those fishing boats because you wanted to be, if not the first, at least among the first back at the fish market. Um, but the reality is that, you know, the lore about it was a race every time, you know, to get, uh, to, get to, the, uh, to get to the market first and all that. I think that is perhaps a little bit of a legend. Hello there. <laughs> All right. So um, you will uh, have uh, a boat here that doesn't really uh, uh, is not supposed to have any winches. I'm cheating here. I do have one winch here, which is for a couple of purposes. It's quite a large one. One is because I have an asymmetric spinnaker, which is a modern sail, and I just mostly single hand and I can't manhandle it on my own without a winch. And the other is if the um, uh, if the anchor that, that gets stuck, uh, you set up a tackle uh, on the on, on one of the shrouds, and then you use the winch to uh, to get your anchor out of the mud or behind a rock, or whatever the case might be. 
Um, another thing that is different uh, in, in terms of not original is uh, the Stabit, uh, which I built and is actually, you can see a little bit broken on the left, so I've got to fix that. Uh, but um, basically uh, in order to get the tender uh, out of uh, harm's way uh, when we are out coastal, uh, if we are beyond um, a few miles uh, from uh, the uh, the land or if the weather gets bad, then the tender goes uh, on the roof. Um, coming inside. It's a pretty large um, open space. Um, also a little bit of a departure from, from the old days. Um, but basically the idea is that this is for you know, a man and his kids or a single handler. And so there's no real need for privacy. Uh, there is a head on the left, uh, which uh, you cannot see because the door is closed behind that painting. Um, there is a, a very simple kitchen. It's all really very simple systems uh, and uh, a double bed uh, on this side. And then uh, these here would be for the kids uh, to sleep on. And I apologize, it's a bit messy because we're out for a couple of days and we've got a barbecue going on the shore. And so there's a lot of, uh, of provisions. Um, there's some really interesting things going on in terms of the sides here. You can see that the the the, um, uh, the windows do open and there is a groove all around the boat to catch both any sort of light water coming in uh, or uh, to uh, catch um, uh, condensation. Uh, and of course, uh, when you're out, you need to lock uh, those those um, uh, those uh, windows and, and the skylight above. Uh, in order to avoid uh, any ingress of water. I've got a, a bit of a, a shade in front of it to uh, sort of uh, get the, the sun out of the way. So this is a boat in terms of sailing qualities that is extremely sea kindly. There is no autopilot. Uh, and because the keel is essentially straight and goes down from 60 centimeters at the front uh, to 1.6 meters at the back, uh, she is basically uh, the same profile as a regular uh, table knife. And what that means is that she's extremely stable and can self-steer on any point of sail that you choose. This is a boat that is sailed not with a tiller, but with the sails. Once you balance the sails, she will go, she will keep going at the same angle relative to the wind, however uh, far that you want to go, even upwind. She most definitely does not point um, as well as uh, your boat, Peter, um, probably about 45 degrees. Um, but because the shape of the hull is in the shape of a heart, the belly of that hull gets into the water really quickly as you heal. And it's basically impossible to overturn a boat like that. It's extremely safe. Um, the rig would probably explode. The, the blocks would probably explode before you could tip the mast in the water. The forces are so strong. Um, you pay for that in speed. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And so good speed would be 5.5, 6.5. I've done 8.5 knots also coming into the harbor with those waves. You know, that's wonderful. Um, I've come on the way 100 miles uh, out to sea, uh, essentially 100 miles out. Um, sorry, not 100 miles, 100 kilometers out. So 60 miles out, uh, the heads down to Jarvis Bay. Uh, between sunrise and sunset, which I reckon is a pretty good is a pretty good clip of about eight knots. I suspect I had a little bit of help from the current, but let's uh, let's uh, uh, just not let that uh, um, uh, dampen our enthusiasm. Um, so the wheel uh, is connected to the rudder uh, via a um, a screw, a, a bronze screw, and um, as a result of that you don't really need to hold the wheel. Um, once you've got the wheel where you want it, because maybe you've got a bit of Lee Helm or something like that, just leave it there and it will just stay there. So the result of all this is you can sail as much as you want. You're not gonna go fast, but there is no fatigue. You don't really, you just balance your sails. You don't really need to mind her. She, would, she will mind her own business. If you want to hove to, uh, to heave to, there, there is an apparatus at the front that I will show that makes that pretty much automatic. And so therefore, um, you know, as long as you're not in a hurry, you should not be stressed. Um, but again, as I said, you pay for that in performance compared to a modern boat. So let's have a look around. Um, one of the interesting features of this boat is that it has a cell packing jib. So if you go to the front, you can see that there is this big um, 
steel bar going across here, which in French is called a leg breaker for very good reason, in fact. Uh, and that the, um, uh, the uh, uh, staysail, the working jib, uh, is connected to that. So basically what that means is that when the boat uh, is uh, tacking or even jibing, she will come back uh, without any sort of intervention uh, onto the other side um, and um, just you know rest there at whatever setting that you set. And you can see that connected to that ring, there is a rope that goes here to a little block and then goes aft where it jams into a, a cam cleat. And what that does is if you block that and then you uh, um, tack, the sail, the jib will not come on to uh, the lee side and will stay on the windward side. And basically what that means is the only thing that you have to do in order to uh, heave to on this boat is to jam this little rope into this uh, camp cleat um, and um, she will just do all the work for you. The same uh, is also true on the other side. Uh, in terms of the rig, if I can just move to the back. In terms of mainsail, so you've got a wooden mast, a bit of maintenance, no doubt about that. Uh, she's a gaff rig um, and so she does have uh, a, a topsail. Um, I've kind of made a uh, 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 some experiments you can see that there is this little carbon fiber pole that produces there, and that is essentially um, the, um, the, um, the 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 jackyard for the uh, uh, for the uh, topsail, uh, just to try and reduce the workload. I'm still experimenting with it. I'm not I'm not sure that I'm going to keep that. Um, but anyway, uh, you get the sails up by uh, pulling uh, pulling on these two ropes, which are the throat and the peak halyard, and that basically connect back down to this block here and these two blocks there, uh, and allow you to uh, get the, uh, uh, the gaff, which is the upper boom uh, up. So it's a bit of work, um, but the good thing about this is that coming down into those lazy jacks, you really just have to let it go. If you control the descent of the halyards, it will all come down back onto uh, the boom without you having to do too much work. And this is true whether you are upwind or downwind, as long as the wind is not too strong. So it makes uh, reducing sail quite easy. Um, you, you've got uh, two reefs in that, uh, in that main uh, that you can take. And uh, really you don't have to pull uh, on much of anything uh, when, you're, when you're reefing. You just need to adjust your ropes um, and uh, you know, cleat them properly, and uh, it'll all uh, it'll all come down uh, and in in the right uh, places. Uh, it should be also mentioned that uh, in addition to the um, uh, staysail, uh, the work the working jib, there is also a flying jib, uh, which is in the front, uh, and um, that is called the flying Yankee. It's a high cut, and so uh, the uh, sheet for that. Uh, comes back all the way aft. Uh, I also use an asymmetric spinnaker, which is a really nice, uh, very powerful uh, sail uh, downwind, and um, just puts the the boat uh, on a uh, uh, on a literally on rails, uh, just like a train. Um, of course, what you um, have here is a four meter bowsprit, uh, which really uh, greatly uh, in increases the options that you have for the sails that you can put up. Uh, so uh, up to four, um, but, but uh, is, uh, you know, I think could be seen as a little bit impractical in that it's quite easy if you're not careful uh, to really scare the boats around you with that big, uh, with that big uh, ramming, uh, ramming pole. So two very different boats, uh, one much more modern, uh, one much older, one with uh, certainly better performance and certainly better performance to windward but still very comfortable, very luxurious. Um, the other with perhaps more space in the cockpit, you can see the length onto different, but there's, you know, the cockpit here versus the cockpit there. Um, but you pay for a little bit more of that space uh, on deck with uh, lower uh, performance. There's definitely no doubt about this. So slightly 
uh, two different philosophies, but they will certainly get you to your destination all the same. Um, the key, I suppose, is to not be in too much of a hurry. <laughs> and now on to our third boat, which is a power boat, but actually has a little bit of a secret in its origin, doesn't it? Okay. I'm trying not to fall in the water as well. Yeah, don't, don't <laughs> fall um, Hi, I'm Ross Gardner, and this boat was built by my father. And if you could take her out of the water and have a look, she's a great big old fashioned 12 foot skip. She was built as a boy's boat to go fishing and watch sailing races, so there are no fancy bits. But that doesn't stop us having a lot of fun. Uh, it is very economical. It isn't fast, but fast enough. Uh, an hour from my place to Manly, which is the Lancaster River. Um, we can go to places that lots of other boats can't go to because she only draws eight inches of water. And again, a little bit like the last boat we were on, she steers easily. You don't have to cling on to the wheel. You set up where you want to go and just with the littlest adjustment, you're on your way. Uh, it's built out of Pacific maple, because that's all I could afford. It's not an exact length because it's as long as the boat chair. And well, not quite as long as the boat chair. And she's about 22 foot 11 and 13 sixteenths of an inch long because no one ever measured it. <laughs> they just built it. The design is my father's. And he spent many hours drawing pictures on it. She's work in progress. Aren't they all? <laughs> Forever. It's a wonderful book. This side's painted. That side's in the throes of being painted again. I'm sure it will happen in due time. It will. It was put on hold for today because oh. I couldn't miss today. So this is this is a, a key thing with wooden boats, right? And the same the same thing happens with mine. Yeah. You have to make a choice, yeah. right? If you're always maintaining the boat, and that's okay, that's that's a good hobby, but you're not sailing, and so we have to just choose our maintenance periods carefully. Exactly, and so it's. I used to worry about things not being perfect, but I realized when you go down the harbor for the day, you're going to damage the boat. That's you right. don't do anything to stop what you've done as maintenance. You just go back and carry on. And once you've done it, if you get the boat up to a certain standard, it's only little bits. A little, off, a little and often is better than a major refit every 20 years. Because the major refit every 20 years, the boat would be out of action for probably two years while you fiddle and diddle. So use it. You won't wear it out using it, yep. but it'll go rotten yep. if you do nothing. Yeah. This is another key thing, which is it's the rainwater of keeping the boat around that rots your boat. Yep. If you want to clean your boat, get that bo boat into the salt, into the salty water and sail that boat, and that salty water will destroy all the organisms that rock wood. I, I have to come down the harbour in this boat. On lousy days, when it's blowing and nasty, and just stick my nose out the head so that I get yeah, spray I agree. all over, everywhere. That's right. Because that's the best thing. At the only time the boat got rot in the cabin, was when it sat on the mooring just after my father died and it wasn't used. Yeah. And bits of it went wrong. Yep. yep. It used to have a varnish cabin. And unfortunately I couldn't I couldn't look after all the other boats in this boat and keep it varnished. Mm -hmm. So we painted it. And that's good because we can do it up and it looks good for a while and it's easy to look after. Mm -hmm. 
So the original free board was less than what oh, it is now, right? And my father put two extra planks on. And by doing that, it doesn't seem much, but you imagine the deck there. The boat was just that little bit smaller. But this is made a, I mean, you can have, and we have, a dozen people in this boat. We move the engine box to there, for lunch, bottles of wine, fabulous. Sounds like a pretty good day out to me. They are. And if you want to bail out, it has no toilet. <laughs> you know where to go. That's where you go. <laughs> that sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. That was very, very informative and entertaining. An absolutely gorgeous boat, showing that really... You know, you don't need, you know, the, all the fancy stuff, you know, and, you know, th this is this is just, you know, wonderful enjoyment for the whole family. Well, as the, as the song says, some are happy, some are not. Just be thankful for what you've got. <laughs> and I am. Yeah. <laughs> and to finish off, let's have another look at, you know, the gorgeous place that we are here in today, Bantry Bay. Uh, we are actually, for people who are not around from Sydney, we're actually in the middle of the city. Uh, on the left, we've got uh, French's Forest. Uh, and on the right, I'm not sure what we've got. I think we've got Killani Heights. Uh, and so, you know, you're, you're, you've got these places in Sydney where you're kind of in the middle of every, everything, but actually because it's really well protected um, in terms of, uh, you know, the national parks and everything, you still have a lot of seclusion and a lot of nature. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Uh, we hope to uh, see you at uh, next year's Pantry Bay Raft Up. This was, uh, you know, not a, not, a, not a fancy webcast. This was just, uh, you know, three boats and uh, why they're all uh, different and why they're all excellent. Have a great day.